with me. We're going to uh, the book of John. John chapter 18. Uh, verse 33 to 40. I want you to do this. Um, just declare with me. Jesus, Jesus. is king. king. It's catchy, isn't it? It'd make, it'd make for a good album, album name. We're going to do that. Jesus is king. All right, I, wa- I want you to do it again. And I, I, you're like, I'm at church. I shouldn't have to... Uh, be involved. All right, so there. This isn't Netflix, so let's all participate, okay? Uh, I want you to declare, Jesus is king. He is my victorious king. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, uh, John 18, verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters and again called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord? Or did others say it to you about me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom. Okay, interesting. So are you a king? Jesus is like, who's asking, right? Uh, But Jesus kind of answers this question here. He says, my kingdom, so he answered the question, right? Because who has kingdoms? Kings have kingdoms. Check it out. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born. I want, I want you to declare this with me. For this purpose, For this purpose I, was born. I was born. Good. And for this purpose I have come into the world. To bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And then Pilate said to him, what is truth? Which is just funny. Like that's, just, like, that's totally like a total postmodern millennial thing, right? Like, we're having this great conversation, and then, like, and then Pilate's like, like, goes philosophical. Yeah, but what is truth, man? And is that, like, your truth, or is that, like, my truth? Whoa! <laughs> like, Pilate the stoner. All right, and then he goes, and <laughs> he's, he's all like, I don't know, Pilate needs Jesus. After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews, and he told them, like, so here's all the Jews. And they, they want him dead because of who he declares to be, right? And so Pilate goes out. He goes, and Pilate just does not care what the Jews think about him. Pilate goes out. He goes, yeah, I don't really see any fault with him. And then he goes, but you have a custom that I should release one man uh, to you at Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Just to kind of put salt in the wound. Isn't that funny? They're so mad. Okay, anyways. You'll get used to me. So then they cried out again, not this man, but give us Barabbas. Barabbas the robber. Let's just pray really quick. We're going to need it. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Father, for what you're doing on the earth. Lord, we thank you that for this purpose we were born. For this very day we were born. And Lord, we welcome your authority in this service. Lord, we welcome your, the, the, the frequency of your presence and the very person of your presence that is the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of victory. Lord, we thank you that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is victorious king over everything. And God, I ask, Lord, that your kingship and that your authority would invade this realm, this time, and this space, Lord. Hey, and Lord, I ask that everything that is uh, chaotic and demonic and anxious, Lord, that it would bow in this room to your kingship, just like it did in the first service. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Good. Now, 
this is an interesting passage that we just read. It's interesting that we're reading at Christmas time. Um, but um, uh, th- the mystery here to Pilate, Pilate is super confused because this guy is being presented as a king. And so Pilate's like questioning Jesus like, how is it that you're, how is it that you're, that you're, that you're a king? How is it that you're the, 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 the king of the Jews? And the reason why this is so confusing is because um, like the word king means like the, the, the source of power and authority. And here's Jesus claiming to be a source of sovereignty, of power and authority. And yet it would appear as though he's greatly lacking in power and authority. Right? Basically, a prisoner. You know, and kings are not prisoners. Right? So Pilate is clearly, like, perplexed. He's like, how is it that you claim to be a a source of authority, and yet right now you don't have any? How is it that you're claiming to be a source of power, and yet you're clearly demonstrating a sense of powerlessness? And what's interesting here is that um, we see in this darkness, in this spiritual darkness, in this madness, um, in this chaos, in, this, in, in, in the demonic chanting. We hear, we hear the roar, crucify him, crucify him. We hear the roar, give us Jesus. Like they want to they wanna kill this guy. And here we see Jesus is about to face certain death. And in that moment of facing certain death, what does Jesus say? For this purpose, I was born. A lot of us at Christmas time, when we think about, you know, Jesus, and we think about, like, him coming, we think about the wise men, the shepherds, and all this, sometimes we forget about the purpose of why he came. And here's the thing is that when we forget about the purpose of Jesus, oftentimes it's easy to forget about our purpose. And we, when we forget our purpose, when, when we don't have the ability to clearly say, for this purpose, I was born, then what do we do? We begin to engineer our lives around other purposes. And we begin to sometimes believe the lie that for this lie, I was born. And I got really good news. He created you in his image and likeness that in eternity past he knew you, he formed you, he created you, he saved you, he called you, he ordained you. Maybe nobody else sees the gold in you. Maybe nobody else really cares for you all that much, but he loves you, he formed you, he has called you, he created you, and for this purpose, for this day, you are born. And here's Jesus, king, powerless, defeated, And Pilate tripping, saying, what kind of king are you? And Jesus said, in this seeming defeat, for this purpose, I was born. I got a question for you. How secure do you have to be? How glorious do you have to be? How much vision do you have to have? In that moment, to respond with humility, to know that it is your role to defer your glory, to take on the shame and the agony because of love for humanity. Because I don't know about you, but like if it were, if it were me, this story would have been different. Like if, like, like if he was like, what kind of king are you? Like, you, like you're, a disgrace to all, you're a disgrace to all kings. Like, 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 I know a lot of kings, and you were just, like, not very, ki- like, you know, if, if it were me, like, I, I, I would have gone, like, ten, ki- ten kinds of divine X-Men on it. Like, I would have, like, are you a king? I would take it on my sunglasses and just been, like, does this answer your question? <laughs> Fire everywhere. You're all dead. Like, what just happened? I just killed you. I just killed all you fools. Yes, I am king. And you're dead, right? We we do know that when Jesus hung on the cross, it says that he he could have called forth for scores of angels to come and actually rescue him. And there in that moment, he defers his glory and endures the shame and agony, the reproach 
of sin. Absolutely fascinating. Isn't it just incredible? Look how just Jesus stands in, the, in this place. And this is fascinating. Jesus, Jesus, our victorious king, who at this point in time doesn't look very uh, victorious. And we know that on the cross, he declares, it is finished. And for this purpose, he was born. And what do we know? That after Jesus died, that it says that Peter would say, this is kind of crazy. And I went down this rabbit hole in the first service. And it was so much fun. That I'm going to take all y'all down in this service. Okay. Now, and let's just pray that we come back out of this rabbit hole and that this service makes some sort of sense. But I, I discern you're mature, so let's do it together. All right. Um, <laughs> mature you are. Mm -hmm. All right. Jesus is hanging on the cross, right, and he declares, it is finished. And Peter would say that Jesus then descends into Hades where he begins to bring good news to the prisoners who are locked up in Hades. All right, uh, fascinating. Now, I, I want to remind you of Jonah and the whale. Um, now, I actually spoke with a young man on the phone this last week. Maybe he's even watching. He's such a new believer. He's never even heard of, of the story of Jonah and the whale. You know, because I was going to teach him about Jonah. I was like, you know Jonah and the whale? He's like, the whale? There's whales in the Bible, right? Like, okay, so if that's you, awesome. God bless you. I'm glad you're here. There is in the Bible a book called Jonah, okay? And, um, and we hear this story in Sunday school about Jonah and the whale. Okay, now here's the thing. Um, there's not really a, a word translated for whale. Like when you read the, the story of Jonah, there's no word to translate whale. So when we teach our kids about Jonah and the whale, th that's, not, that's not accurate. In fact, um, so there's this scholar, brilliant, respected scholar named Michael Heiser. You can check out his podcast. It's called the, Na the Naked Bible Podcast. And he's got a podcast on there called um, Jonah and the Dragon of Chaos. And what he does is he actually begins to look at the Hebrew, and he started answering a bunch of questions. And, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's fascinating. So what, that, that, that word there um, that, we, that we translate is, 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 as, as whale, um, and there's, there's words there in Jonah that, that, could, be, that could describe a great fish. Um, the Hebrews understood as Leviathan. So when you look at paintings that were done of the original Jonah, uh, Jonah's account, you did not see a whale. It did not look like a Sunday school classroom. What you would see is Jonah being swallowed up by a dragon. Now this is, this is fascinating because we see that um, uh, 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 in this moment, okay, Jonah the whale, have you ever thought about this? There's a great storm, or so we're told, and they're thinking, oh no, a storm. We better throw somebody in the water. God's angry. No, okay. So if you're a sailor, you know that there's storms. It says in the book of Jonah that a tempest, right, a storm came upon the waters. That's how our English Bibles read it. But if you look in the Hebrew, what it actually says is that there was a tempest in the waters. So here's what begins to happen. The waters begin to stir, okay, and what do they do? They draw straws and they offer Jonah as bait to the sea dragon. What is this? This is a prophetic drama of Christ Jesus who would be offered up on a cross, on a great hook, offered to Satan, Leviathan, who would come and swallow up Jesus, Jesus who would go into the belly of the dragon for three days. Now, we read Jonah, and it says that the whale um, vomited up Jonah on the shore, which again is interesting that you would have a, a whale that would like just... But here you have a type and shadow for Satan that actually um, uh, uh, spits, uh, spits up Jesus out of the belly of the tomb. After three days, we see Jesus walk out of the tomb, not as a victim, but victorious. Stepping out after just redeeming all of humanity back to the Father.
You see, here's the problem, you guys. We read the Old Testament and we think that those are isolated stories. And so we read Job and we think, oh, that poor guy. And then it's taught like this. Like, like you know, and so if your life is kind of crappy, consider jo- Job. His life got better and so will yours, hopefully. No, listen. The story of Job is not a metaphor for your crappy life. The story of Job is a prophetic drama pointing to Christ Jesus, the true and perfect innocent sufferer who would stand in our place to redeem and restore and bring humanity into the restoration, into the place where everything that the enemy has lost has been restored and there's recompense and repayment. We talked about Joshua and Jericho recently. So now you're a little Joshua. So go out and march around your city. You know, you know, God will defeat your, your, your barrier. No, no. Joshua is a prophetic drama of the true and perfect Jesus. Joshua's name actually means Yeshua. Why does that matter? Because for some of us living in 2020, we're saying a lot of silly things right now. Like, we just need to be more loving. But what the world needs is love. No, no, no. What the world needs is Jesus. And who is Jesus? Jesus is not just defined by the Gospels. You don't just see Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Where do you see Jesus? You see him in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Judges. You see him in the book of Jonah. You see him in the book of Job. That All of the Old Testament. And this is how we have to teach our kids the Bible. That when we look at these stories, we get to see the fullness of the character and nature of Jesus as king, not just humble, Galilean, peasant with Birkenstocks and gray hair. I want you to declare it with me. Jesus is my victorious king. Hades could not keep him. The the dragon of chaos. And Jesus came walking out. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is king. And that means he is the source for all power and true authority. And if you believe that, then what do you have to fear? When you believe that the one that you ascribe value and worth to, when you believe that the one that you have given your life to, when you believe that the one that you have completely surrendered all of yourself to is the original source of all power and life and hope, it stems from him. And when you believe that his very spirit is dwelling and abiding in you and you believe that you are possessed, By his life and light and fire, then you know that the enemy cannot do anything to you. You belong to Jesus. He who the Son sets free is unquestionably free. We are called to reflect and represent the glorified, risen Christ. Therefore, if you're a son, you must get out of the belly of the dragon of chaos. All right, let's come out of the rabbit hole now, you know. You know, pop your little rabbit head out of that little rabbit hole. I'm, we made it. That was fun. Take a deep breath. <sighs> Good. Jesus is alive. And he gives his people a commandment. It's called the Great Commission. And Anthony and I, we were just chatting about the Great Commission just this last week, you know, to uh, go into all the world and preach the gospel, right? Sometimes we forget what Jesus says before he gives them the commandment. What does Jesus say? This is uh, Matthew 28, verse 18. All authority. Okay. In the Greek, that word all means all. (laughs) Declare with me right now. All authority. Listen now. This awakening means being awakened to our authority in Christ. We are being awakened, waking up to our authority of who we are in him and who he is in us. All authority in heaven and on earth, not just in heaven. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go 
make disciples of all nations. It does not say make disciples of all people. You notice that? It doesn't just say, go and tell people everywhere that Jesus loves them. No, what does it say? Go and make disciples of nations. Why does it say nations? Because that's how kings think. Kings think cities and nations. This is what he says. He says, um, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and the Spirit, teaching them to observe. Um, that word teaching means commanding. What do kings do? They, leg they legislate orders. This is what he says, to observe. What does that mean, observe? Again, we've got more kingly Jesus. You know, Jesus was really big into the kingdom, right? Like everything that he taught was about the kingdom. And then when he talks, he uses these kingly words, these governmental words. So he says, teaching them to observe. Just say observe. observe. What does that mean? It means to guard. All that I have commanded you. Again, the word command. It's a legal word. It's a military word. So that we are to go. We are to disciple entire nations. Teaching them how to guard the revelation of the kingdom that Christ Jesus has given to us. Now, if that's a command, if that's the great commandment for the church, which you're the church and I'm the church, amen? If that's a great commandment, think about the countless stupid messages that we have heard over the years that had everything to do with everything, but nothing to do with the one thing that Jesus said to do. As the church goes, so goes the culture. We've been tricked. We've been lied to. By what? By a demon. Called what? Called the spirit of religion. That does what? That comes to trick you into thinking that you're a dumb lamb. That you're just a sheep. When Jesus says, I now call you friends, which means I'm revealing to you my secrets, which means this. The problems that exist within the world exist because there are thrones that have not been sat in yet. Peace. <laughs> <laughs> Come back next week and I'll explain. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Who wants to give again? Golden Bulls. Um. Oh no, I'll, I'll explain it to you. Okay, when I was a kid, um, there there was this this. I remember watching a, a cartoon version. It gave me nightmares. It's nothing like Sesame Street. It's called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It's written by um, C.S. Lewis. Okay, and a lot of us will know. See, well, a lot of us will know this this story. Totally, totally crazy, right? Like just creepy. Got these crazy fawns that play flutes, like <laughs> you know, like they're like they can hypnotize you with their flute music. You'll follow. I'll take you to the witch, and she'll eat you. like terrifying, terrifying as a kid. You got Lucy, Edmund, and Peter, right? And they go through a wardrobe, and they end up in Narnia. And the very first thing that they realize is that there's snow everywhere. And they think it's really enchanting and really, really cool. Um, except for in Narnia, the snow is an indication of a false leader's kingdom authority over that world. So wherever there is snow, the snow is an indicator of the jurisdiction of that false leader's authority. Because in Narnia, they've been stuck underneath the curse of perpetual winter. So they hadn't seen spring or summer in however long. Now, the story goes, as you follow these, these kids' adventure, that as they're going through this adventure, they all of a sudden begin to discover their identity and calling in that Mr. and Mrs. Beaver <laughs> re reveal to them the ancient prophecy about the four empty thrones that when the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve sit down in their thrones, the curse 
would be broken. So here you have a world with Oslan, uh, and yet you have a remaining curse that cannot be broken until the sons and daughters discover who they are, and they have the courage to step into their place of royal authority and can sit in their thrones. And when they sit in their thrones, the curse is broken. That C.S. Lewis had a revelation that the church is just now starting to get a glimpse of that Aslan did his job laying his life down for the sins of the children. That Jesus has done what he was called to do and now the king waits. The king waits for the sons and daughters of God to awaken to who they are so that we will step into our royal authority. We will step into our lineage of of royal authority and that we will occupy the empty thrones that the Lord has established for his bride. That it's not good enough, and I better not see SRCers putting this on their Facebook, that the world is going to hell, but at least Jesus is still on his throne. That makes you sleep better at night. You turn on the news. I'm not yelling at you. I'm yelling with you, okay? I love you. You turn on the news. You watch CNN. You watch ESPN. That's a little better. You know, you watch, we did that last night, fight night. You, you, you go, you know, all of these different places. And what do I see? I see snow on every channel. I see everything evidence that the wicked witch, the false leader who does not have governmental authority legally, why? Because on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. So if Jesus is done, he said, for this purpose I was born, then what's the gap? We've been lied to. And we have not known what to say for this purpose. I was born. We don't know what to say there. We don't know what the gap is there. But this is what I can tell you. There is an empty throne. And we are being invited to repent for advocating our authority. And we get to be invited in Christ to be seated with him in heavenly place. Now listen, we, all, we read Paul like, well, I am seated with Jesus in heavenly places. And we think that's a big high chair up in heaven. (laughs) Can I get some applesauce, daddy? (laughs) This seat is a throne. Joe McIntyre, incredible leader in in our region, incredible teacher. He wrote a book called Throne Life. In fact, Randy Clark got a hold of it and just really promoted the book and Randy and he would do these healing schools. He would invite Randy to, to come from Bothell all around the world to teach throne life. What was the purpose of it? Joe had this revelation that in him we live, died, resurrected, ascended, and are seated, enthroned in his royalty. And that we are being awakened in this season to our royalty. That the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve can step into our inheritance. And this is why all creation is groaning and waiting for the manifested sons to awaken to who they are. When we say yes to this, when we realize that we don't really have an excuse for immaturity. We really don't. You know what I'm saying? I mean, let's, may, maybe you just got saved this morning. That's cool. All right, you, you, you get a pass. <laughs> but like, what, what excuse, you know, you know what I'm saying? That when we say yes to him and when we say no to well, just our, our silly thinking and, and that victim thinking and, and, that, and that, you know, we say no, I'm not going to remain in the, in the belly of the, of the dragon of chaos. I'm going to walk out with Jesus out of, out of the tomb, when we say yes, guess what? We begin maturing. And our maturity 
brings forth a new perspective. And our new perspective will begin to dictate our new behaviors. Because now we can't associate with certain activities or certain schools of thought. Why? It's not kingly. Just declare with me right now. Jesus is my victorious king. We're not saying that he will be. We're not saying that he was. We're saying that he is. Is there a part of your heart where there's snow? Is there a part of your mind where there's snow? And how do you know that there's snow there? Because wherever there's snow, the witch can come in on her sled. How many of you got a witch come in, coming into your mind on her sled all the time? Yeah, I'll give you some Turkish delights. Ha ha. Oh, uh, hey, witch. Oh, yeah, Turkish delights. Yeah, okay. That sounds delicious. Do you have a part of your life, a part of your, a part of your heart, where that witch gets to just come whenever she wants? How do you know that you, you need boundaries in your life? Because you got witches in your life that come and go and they rob, they steal, they kill, and they destroy. No more. You're a king. It's time to sit down in that throne. This last week we got to see some witches judged. I'm not talking about people. I'm not talking about that thing that you guys, you know, we know. We're family. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about spirits. I'm talking about Things that come to steal, kill, and destroy. We saw them get judged at the foot of the cross. We saw people get set, set free. We're talking about stories that, that we're not talking about here right now. In the first service, we saw, we saw some witches' sleds get just snapped to stinking pieces. That's for all of us. That's for all of us. And this next week when you see somebody, Jessica, and you're talking to somebody, and you see the evidences, you see the sled tracks of the witch, you'll be like, "Uh uh-uh. Why? Because we're waking up to our royalty. Jesus is my victorious king, therefore I will be victorious. Jesus is my victorious king, therefore I will be victorious in my marriage. Therefore divorce is not an option. Shut your face, Satan. Jesus is victorious in my sexuality. Jesus is victorious in my occupation. Therefore, I will be victorious in my, es- in my, hey, Jesus is victorious in my eschatology. Therefore, my end times beliefs and theology will not instigate fear and, and, and weirdness. That Jesus is victorious in my end times beliefs so that when I think about the future, my heart gets flooded with hope and joy. If you've got an end times worldview that whenever you think about it, you get really freaked out, you took the wrong pill, honey. You need to cough it up. I'll tell you what happens. He wins. Yeah, no, no, no. No, I'll tell you how. Hey, he already won. Don't say Jesus wins. No, you're wrong. In the end, we win. No, that's, that's, you're wrong. No. We already won 2,000 years ago. We don't pray for victory. We stand in the realm of victory and we rule and reign with Christ Jesus in heavenly places. Settle for nothing less than God's very best. And say hell no to the snow. There will be no snow in my mind. There will be no snow in my emotions. There will be no snow in my will. What do you do when, the, when you see snow? You command it to go. You command, what do you do when you see snow? You command it to go. Why? Because you're royalty, you're royal blood. 
What do you do when you see the snow? You command it to go, Dinah. You command it to go because greater is he who is in you than, than any, anything that is in the world. People, I love it when people, the beautiful lady was telling me about some crazy demonic stuff. It was, and it was crazy. It was, it was like, the, it, it would it'd make for a great movie. And all of a sudden I began to laugh. Not because it was funny. It wasn't funny. I began to laugh. Why? Because Jesus thought they were funny. How many of you know that when you laugh at something, all of a sudden you can't really be afraid of something that, I don't know if you've ever seen a shark underwater without a cage, but you don't sit there laughing. No, you freak out like you about to die. If there's any sort of demon, any sort of principality, any sort of witchcraft, that's the kind of stuff that makes our Father laugh. It says in the Psalms that He sits back up in the heavens and He puts His feet up and He sits there and He la laughs. He laughs with mockery at his, at his enemies. Listen, sin, we can laugh at it. Why? It's powerless. Sickness, disease, even death itself. Paul, Paul would say, what are you going to do? Kill me? <laughs> I'm already dead. I said, Jesus is your victorious king. He is. He is. He is. He is victorious. You can walk in victory. You can stand. I said, He is. I prophesy to the air. He is. I speak over Seattle. He is. He is. He is. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? He is victorious. He is mighty. He is strong. He is the ancient of days. He is so I am. He is so I am. He is so I am. He is, so I am. I'm being awakened. I'm being awakened to sit on my throne, to rule, reign with Christ Jesus. Oh no, I'm sorry. I, I'm not going back. I'm not going back to that old way of thinking. I'm not going back to that shame based way of thinking. I'm going forward. My family is going with me. You're going too. Say to the snow, you got to go. Speak to the snow. Command it to go. Maybe you didn't hear me. I said, speak to the snow. Command it to go. Command it to go. Command the snow to go. Let's stand. Holy and righteous King, we declare your authority in the midst of us. We declare your great presence. We say you are the object of our affection. You are the object of our praise. We declare Jesus the Christ over our family, over this church, over this region. We declare Jesus, the risen, victorious Christ over 2020, 2021, 2022. We declare Jesus, the risen, victorious Christ in our physical bodies right now. We declare all sin, all sickness, all disease come underneath the blood of Jesus right now. I said right now. I said right now. I said right now. I said right now, I said right now, everything that is not holy, everything that is not good, everything that blasphemes the authority of the risen Christ, we command it to go right now in Jesus' name. We speak to it. We command it to bow before the authority of Jesus the Christ. Just declare, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Th this is what I know, guys. In five years, let's just go five. It's, ar it's arbitrary. When you turn on the news in Seattle, there's going to be less snow because of you. Because of you. And we are going to see the evidence of the justice of Jesus. 
because of our willingness to sit on our throne. The problem wasn't the lack of Aslan. The problem was the lack of revelation in the children. They didn't know who they were. They didn't know about their thrones. And now you know. And now you're accountable.